And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Whenever I think about forgiveness, I think about these words of Christ from the Lord's Prayer and from the Sermon on the Mount. And I also often think of a little book called The Sunflower by Simon Weisenthal. Weisenthal was a Jew who suffered much tragedy in World War II, and he tells a story about how he was held in a German concentration camp. And there he saw countless deaths and atrocities throughout the war and throughout his time at the concentration camp as Hitler and the Nazi regime sought to exterminate the Jewish people. And a nurse in the camp brought him into the room of a dying soldier, a dying German soldier. And this soldier wanted to confess to him his sins before he died. And the soldier told Weisenthal how he had actually grown up going to church and had even wanted to study theology and become a minister. But instead, he joined the Hitler Youth and soon found himself caught up in the regime's evil plan. And one of the crimes that he committed in particular continued to haunt him day after day. At one point, the Nazi soldiers had gathered up some 200 of the Jewish people, crammed them into a house, detonated grenades, lit the house on fire, and shot those who tried to escape. And Weisenthal could not bear to hear what was being said, but this man continued to share with them what he had done. And then he asked Weisenthal to do something incredibly hard. He asked him to forgive him for his crimes. And when he heard this dying German soldier ask him to forgive what many would say was unforgivable. Weisenthal didn't know what to say or what to do. He just stood there in silence. And then he walked out of the room without giving an answer. In the book that he later wrote, Weisenthal interviewed some 53 different religious and moral religious leaders, and he asked them whether or not he should have forgiven this man who asked him for forgiveness, this dying German soldier. And of those that were asked whether or not he should forgive, 17% said they didn't know. They were uncertain. 18% said that he should have forgiven him. But 64% said no, he should not forgive him. That the crimes that he committed were so bad, so evil, so heinous, That to forgive them would be condoned them. And he should not have forgiven. And this group that he interviewed was a mix of people from different faiths, different backgrounds. There were Christian leaders. There were Catholic. There were Jewish and Buddhist. And yet less than 20% of those religious leaders, those thought leaders, said that he should forgive. Clearly, this shows that forgiveness is hard. The greater the offense, the deeper the wound, the harder it is to forgive. Perhaps you've struggled with this, forgiving someone. Or perhaps you feel that you need forgiveness and wonder if it's really for you. So with all this in mind, What is it that Jesus says about forgiveness? Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his disciples how they should pray. And forgiveness is indeed a central part of this prayer. And he says, of course, this is how you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's such a familiar prayer to all of us. But one which perhaps we oftentimes fail to really sink into our lives and our hearts as to what really this prayer is all about. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today 
our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus goes on and says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Just a bit on the structure of this Lord's Prayer, which is found both in Matthew's Gospel and a version in Luke's. The address, first of all, is, of course, to God. And it says, may your name be hallowed. That is, may it be revered as holy. May people honor your name, your person. And then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is a case of Hebrew parallelism. That is where basically the same thing is said twice, and it means basically the same thing. God's kingdom is about God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, and vice versa. And this prayer, then, is a prayer for everyone to follow God's will here on earth as presumably the angels, the celestial beings, all follow God's will. And the rest of this prayer spells out what God's will is. What does God want for the world? What does he want for us in our lives? God's will from this prayer, we see, is for people to have their basic needs met. Food, daily bread. God's will is for people to overcome temptation, to become more holy. God's will is for people to be delivered from the power of Satan, to have nothing that enslaves us. And God's will is for his people to be a forgiven, and note this, a forgiving community centered around Christ. In this community, sin is overcome. Satan is defeated. People receive and give out forgiveness. And this forgiveness is so important that in Matthew's recording of this prayer at the end, Jesus comes back to forgiveness and he says, and oh, by the way, if you forgive people their sins, you'll be forgiven. But if you don't, you won't. (laughs) So whatever Jesus is saying about forgiveness, clearly it's important. So important that our own forgiveness is somehow conditioned upon whether or not we forgive others. That makes it pretty important, doesn't it? So what's that mean? Does it mean I have to forgive the jerk who cuts me off in traffic, tells me I'm number one? (laughs) How about that bully in school that punched me in my face? I still remember that. still hurts. Well, more personally... How about my spouse, my children, my parents, or perhaps someone here in the church? These types of things are hard enough to think about forgiving. But to forgive what Weisenthal was asked to forgive, the systematic murder of your own people, your own family, your own children, how in the world do you forgive such offenses? It's perhaps understandable why he just walked out of the room, not knowing what to say. But forgiveness is at the core of the gospel. It's at the core of the gospels, including the book of Matthew. And Matthew has his own particular things that he's concerned about. He's concerned about forgiveness in the Christian community and that when someone sins, you should actually go to them so that you can be reconciled. He tells the story, the parable of the unmerciful servant, a servant who is forgiven so much by the king, but then he goes and chokes his fellow servant, and we see that that servant is condemned because he fails to forgive others. And then, of course, Jesus in the Last Supper and taking of the cup, he says, this is the blood of the covenant that's poured out for forgiveness of sins. And anyone who has grown up in the church has heard passages like this, heard stories, heard scriptures about how important forgiveness is. And yet, if that dying soldier had asked you or I to forgive the types of crimes that he committed, what would we say? I don't know about you, but I would struggle with that. And quite frankly, when Jesus says this, 
This must have been another mind-blowing statement by Jesus to the Jews of the first century who also had faced anti-Semitism, who had been ruled over by the Romans and brutally treated, who had had their children sold into slavery when they couldn't pay their debts. There was a reason that the Jewish people revolted against Rome in AD 70, even though politically and militarily it was suicide, but they couldn't take it anymore because of how they were being treated. And now Jesus was saying to them, not only did they have to endure that, but they, that they had to forgive. And if they didn't, they wouldn't be forgiven. It must have brought up all kinds of questions in their minds. As surely forgiveness brings up questions in our minds as well. So in thinking about whether Weisenthal should have forgiven that soldier and whether we should forgive others that perhaps are in our minds today. Perhaps the first question that we should ask is, what exactly is forgiveness? What does it mean to forgive someone? We talk about forgiving and forgetting. I don't know about you, but I don't forget much. Probably your spouse doesn't either. So what is forgiveness? Well, first of all, and this is important to hear, Forgiveness is not saying that what has been done to you was right or okay. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it okay. So that's not what forgiveness means. Forgiving someone else doesn't mean that their sins are absolved before God, that their sins are forgiven before God. That's something that only God can do. And forgiving someone of their sins doesn't mean that God himself can't decide to take vengeance or exact justice. Again, that is for God to decide. So what does it mean then to forgive someone? Well, perhaps Matthew's unique way of talking about forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer can be helpful to us. Matthew says, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, as a kid growing up, and I heard that memorized Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, I thought, that's strange. Why did he say, and forgive us our sins? Why does he say, and forgive us of our debts? Well, sin is spoken of as a debt, something that we owe God, and when someone sins against us, they kind of owe us. Now, debt is never a good thing, uh, never great to be in debt, but in the first century, it was probably a lot worse because if you got into debt, you couldn't just declare bankruptcy. If you couldn't pay your debts, your freedom or that freedom of your children was at stake. Your children could be sold into slavery to pay for your debts. And that's what sin does. It creates a debt against God. And Jesus tells us to pray to God and ask him to forgive us of that crushing debt that our sin creates against God. But that forgiveness, Jesus says, that we so much need and long for and probably recognize that we have against God, that forgiveness, Jesus says, is conditional upon us forgiving someone else the debt that they owe us. Now think for just a minute, indulge yourself about that person you're struggling to forgive. Think about them, what they've done. Doesn't it feel like they owe you something? Money, time, their firstborn child. <laughs> the thing is about debts, when someone owes us, we rarely forget it, right? Recently, one of my friends from college, whose name was Billy, posted on Facebook how he has recently gotten into a practice of sending a, a message or a, a nice note to someone, thanking them, encouraging them. He said, if, if, if you've gotten one of those from me, just know that I think a lot of you and uh, I care about you. And so, of course, I responded and said, well, Billy, I, I hadn't got that note yet, but I'm going to be looking for it soon. <laughs> and he came back to me. He said, you beat me too many times with the cast to get a note. Now, what is he talking about? 
Well, what he was referring to is represented in this picture here of Billy versus James, me back in 1985. What happened? This is a nice, friendly game of basketball you can see there. When I was a kid, I went to a Christian music camp outside of Austin, Texas, and there we'd learn music theory and song leading and all those types of things, and we had some free time, and we had the opportunity to play basketball. Now, back then, Uh, We had to still wear jeans when we were playing. This is, you know, in Austin, Texas, in July, jeans, because you couldn't wear shorts. So, but uh, one summer, I was there at the camp, and actually, I had broken, uh, I had fractured my wrist, and so I had a cast on. Now, you're supposed to, like, shoot like this, right? Basketball, I think. Okay, but I couldn't do that. So what I did, I did the only thing that I could do. I practiced hook shots. And I got to where I could shoot all kinds of hook shots. I had nothing else to do for weeks, just in my backyard, shooting hook shots, practicing little baby hook shots. I could even do it at the free throw line. I could even hit three-pointers with the hook shot. I mean, I was, in my own mind, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar combined with Michael Jordan uh, and Magic Johnson. I mean, I was killing it. Well, I went up and, and we played at that camp against a skinny kid named Billy. And I mean, this is like my athletic peak of my entire life. I beat him every time. And I remember he was like, (sighs) he said, I don't know how you do it, man. I was like, I don't know either, but okay, uh, I'm going to live my moment. Some six years later, I go to college at Oklahoma Christian. I had stayed the same height, perhaps shrunk a little bit. Meanwhile, Billy had grown a foot. (laughs) And when he saw me at OC, he said, you, me, on the court now. (laughs) He wanted his rematch, and here's a picture of that rematch game of Billy versus James in 1991. (laughs) I mean, he had become really good. He could hit three-pointers, he could hit mid-range shots, and he could dunk. He really could, and he dunked right on me, and he could tell he was just loving it. He was just loving it, and he and I went on to become good friends in college. And so that little fun exchange online took us both down a little path of memory lane. And Billy said to me, he said, you beat me too many times with the cast. To get a note, he said, now I'm flooded with memories. He said, learning music theory with you at camp, you playing piano, $600, corral trips. And me running you down the first time I met you in college for a rematch. He remembered that I beat him. But you know what I remembered in that list? $600. Now, Billy, when he was a senior, it looked like he wasn't going to be able to come back to school to finish his degree because he owed money to the school. At that time, you could get, rack up both like student loan debt as well as debt to the school. And they wouldn't let you enroll unless you paid off your debt to the school first and he didn't have the money. Becky and I were newly married. We didn't have a lot of funds, but... We really liked Billy. We just like, this would be terrible if he couldn't finish out his degree. So we loaned him $600 so he could enroll in that semester in school. And it was never paid back. And I have to admit, there were times when I'd see Billy and I loved him and everything, but there was a little thing in the back of my mind like, hey, do you remember that $600? I mean, because it'd be one thing if he said, hey, I don't have the funds, could you, but he, he, he never said anything about it. And isn't that what debts are like, right? When someone owes you, you remember it. You think about it. I remember what you did to me. Are you going to say it? Are you going to acknowledge it? And so I said to him, when he said that about the 600, I said to him, what I should have said a long time ago, first of all, I should have just given it as, as a gift rather than a loan. But I said to him what I should have said years, should have said years ago. Jokingly, I said it, my son... Your $600 is forgiven. (laughs) That was what that dying soldier longed to hear from Weisenthal. Your debt is wiped out. You are forgiven. When we are forgiving someone else, we are releasing them from the debt that they owe to us. Not to God, that's for God to decide, but the debt that they owe to us. We're releasing 
ourselves from that demand for personal revenge, for personal enactment of justice, and leaving those things for God and others to decide. It is seeking to not stay bitter and angry, but letting those feelings go, usually over time because this is so hard, and seeking to show love even to our enemies or sometimes what's even harder, to our family, friends, loved ones who have wounded us many times, sometimes very deeply. So who should we extend this forgiveness to? Well, certainly we should do it to those who come to us and ask for it. In Matthew's gospel, the story is told about how Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how many times should I forgive someone who sins against me? And he says, should I forgive up to seven times? Now you think about it, forgiving someone seven times for the same offense, that's a lot. I mean, first time, what? Shame on you, second time, shame on me, and third time, I've lost count, you're just a jerk. (laughs) Pretty generous on Peter's part, but what does Jesus say? He said, no, you should forgive up to 77 times, or one translation says 70 times 7. Now, I'm not good with math, but I think that's 490 times, which means that you should keep count, and on the 491st time, you don't have to forgive, you can just stick it to them. (laughs) Now, what is Jesus saying? He's saying that you just, what, keep forgiving again and again and again. And if you're in any kind of deep relationship with someone, an ongoing relationship, isn't this what you really have to do with your spouse, with your child, with your parents, even a co-worker, people in the church? Because to be human is to make mistakes. To be human, unless you're Jesus, is to sin. And so we know that We or someone else is going to do or say something stupid. Someone's going to be selfish. Someone's going to be a jerk. And we have to continually forgive and forgive and forgive. Certainly those who come and ask for those forgiveness, this forgiveness, we should do this. But what about that other category? I see some of you nodding your heads. You know what I'm talking about. What about forgiving those who do not, cannot, or will not ask for forgiveness? There are people who have perhaps wronged us in the past that have died. And they never asked for forgiveness, and obviously they're not going to. What about them? There are those who have wronged us deeply. Sometimes they're not even aware of how much they've hurt us. And then there are those who are pretty aware and simply don't really care. Maybe they even enjoy the pain, the misery that they've caused. What Jesus said about forgiveness to Peter, about forgiving someone over and over, is hard enough. But what if they never acknowledge their wrong? To this I can say, all we can do is look at the example of Christ. Maybe he didn't state this quite as explicitly, but what did Jesus show us on the cross? He said what? Father, forgive them. For what? They do not know what they do. What does Jesus do here? He asks for forgiveness for those who clearly are not asking for it themselves, who are in fact (laughs) crucifying him. But he reframes it. He somehow looks at it through their perspective and says, Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Sometimes what can help us to forgive someone else is to think about what they're going through, to think about their mindset. You know, the, the guy who explodes out on the highway, they don't even know us. Obviously, clearly, it's not about us. They have something terrible that's happening that day or going on in their lives. Many times people lash out because they are hurting. And we're an easy target. You're an easy target. <clears throat> on the other side, know that Perhaps you're in a relationship and perhaps someone has forgiven you. They're a a kind, gracious person. They do that. But know that if you've never acknowledged the wrong, 
and asked them to forgive, they on their side may have done that, but it may be hard for really the, the relationship to be fully reconciled, to rebuild trust, all of that. So we still have a responsibility, even if someone just gives us this, this forgiveness, like God does, right? We still have a responsibility on our side to come back to them. But if someone has wronged us, for us to stay angry and bitter, particularly from people that really don't care about us, we're letting them continue to control our lives. Now, how healthy is that? Someone said it's like staying angry and bitter is like drinking poison and expecting your enemies to die. It doesn't work too well. And so we seek to forgive others. One reason, because it allows us to get on with our lives and to be joyful people again but also primarily because of what God has done for us. And this is why perhaps Jesus says that this forgiveness is conditional because if we don't extend forgiveness to others, it may be that we don't understand the gospel, which is that God forgives us not because we deserve it, but out of his great love and kindness for us. And so we forgive and release others so that we can move on and so that we can be this type of community that Jesus envisions, a forgiven and forgiving community. Maximilian Kolbe was a Polish church leader during World War II who helped save some 2,000 of the Jewish people in that time until he was finally arrested and taken and put in the concentration camp in Poland, Auschwitz, notorious camp. I have to say, I've been there, I've walked those streets, it's haunting to be there. You go into different rooms in this now museum and you will see thousands and thousands of cloaks and belts and sun and glasses all from people who had died, the millions of Jews, more than one million Jews had died in Auschwitz alone. Now, as you can imagine, anyone who was sent to that camp wanted to escape. But the Nazis had a brilliant way to try to prevent that. For every one person that escaped, they would kill 10 people in the camp, which meant that you knew that if you escaped, your family, your friends, your loved ones, they would be killed. Well, one day, there was a man that was thought to have escaped. Actually, later was found out that he had, in fact, drowned, which makes what happens after this even more tragic. But the commandant, when he heard that someone had escaped, called all the people together, and he started screaming at them. He said, you will die for this. Ten of you will come forward. You will be killed. You will starve and die of thirst in a bunker. And he began to call out the names of those that would die because this man was thought to have escaped. And one of those who was called was a man named Francis. And Francis, when he heard his name called, he said, no. Can it take me? He said, my wife, my children, what will happen to them? And Colby, when he heard this man cry out, he said to the commandant, I'm old, I'm useless, take me instead. He has a wife, he has children, he has family. Take me instead. And there was just silence. People not knowing whether or not the offer would be taken or if he would be struck down for his insolence. But finally, the commandant accepted the offer. Francis was let free. And Colby took his place. And over the next 10 days, Colby and Nine others from the camp were held in a bunker without food, without water. And Colby encouraged his fellow prisoners 
to pray for his, their captors and, in fact, to treat them with kindness. And one by one, over those 10 days, each of them died until only Colby was left. But they decided that he hadn't died quickly enough. And so they sent in a doctor to inject him with poison so that he would die. And when he came, Colby lifted out his arm and he died. Nothing like this had ever happened in the history of Auschwitz, that someone had given themselves so selflessly for a mere stranger. And the man who was saved from this, Francis, he never forgot what happened. And it was said by one of the survivors of the camp that when news of this story spread throughout the camp of the selfless act of love and self-sacrifice, that it was like a shaft of light went and shattered through the darkness of the camp, that someone could show such love and kindness to a mere stranger. And Francis never forgot this. He was released after the war. He was reunited with his wife, with his children. And he lived to the age of 95 years old. And every year, he went back on the anniversary of Colby's death to the grave that had been set up to commemorate his death. And each year, he went back and he spent the rest of his life telling the story of the man who died for him so that he might live. My friends, this is the Christian story. This is the story that we have the privilege and honor to share. This is God's great story that we tell here in the U.S., in Croatia, in the Dominican Republic, in Vietnam, all around the world. The story that Christ died for our sins. And because of that, we have hope and salvation. And we forgive others, not because they deserve it. They don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But because God has forgiven us. And we seek to be imitators of God. I'm so thankful for all of you. For partnering with us in this gospel. For supporting us. For all those who are involved in short-term missions, for those who are involved with studies online, those who are giving financially, those who are praying for us and all the works here. So thankful for the leaders here, for the members, for all of you. And know that God is alive and at work in the world today. This message of hope and salvation and forgiveness is going throughout the world like a shaft of light shattering the darkness. And we praise God for his great love for us and the hope and forgiveness that he offers to us in Jesus Christ. This morning, it may be that you want to experience this forgiveness, either for the first time or renewed way in your life. It may be that you need to forgive someone that is here, maybe someone right beside you or across the aisle or across the country. Whatever need you have, know that the leaders here are ready to receive you, to pray with you, and to rejoice with you in the hope and salvation that we all have. If you have any need, then please come as together we stand and sing.